Hi, welcome. Thank you for joining us. And I just wanted to introduce Vint Cerf, who is joining us uh, via Hangout, who's going to do the introduction. Hi, Vint. Hi there. Thanks so much for taking time to let me participate remotely. I wish I could be there in person, but it just didn't work out. Uh, first of all, I want to tell you that uh, Carla Lefebvre and I have known Gary for a long time. We were all part of the MCI community for a while. And Carla really believes in what Gary's doing, and I can prove this because this morning she came in with a giant sack of vegetables that she grew in her own garden. So she's practicing what, what Gary preaches. Uh, let me tell you a little bit about Gary. I came across Gary Oppenheimer back in the mid-1980s when we were both at MCI Mail. And he noticed that this was a communication company that wasn't communicating well with its customers, so he connected the dots by creating the first electronic newsletter. Well, he's done it again. Today, most people think about hunger, but few about food waste as its cause. So we spend a great deal of time and money to feed the hungry without actually solving hunger. Gary identified a problem that most people never knew existed the food waste by tens of millions of growers with overly abundant gardens while their nearby neighbors went hungry. His nonprofit, ampleharvest.org, created a, a whole new supply side channel for the American Food Safety Net, not by buying and distributing food as had usually been done, but instead by connecting those dots to unleash both the pent-up supply of freely available locally grown fresh food and community goodwill on a sustainable and lifelong basis, and believing sustainable is really important here. Ampleharvest.org leverages its technology and many of the Google resources to pair growers with local food pantries. It addresses both food waste as the underlying cause of hunger, as well as hunger itself. They use the internet to bring extreme market efficiency to what has in the past been a very inefficient process. It's an inherently scalable and potentially global solution that makes the best use of precious resources we have today. Uh, the long-term outcome is an, is an improvement in the future of health and, by extension, wealth of America, all at no cost to the grower. Many individuals think they can't make a difference today, but this whole process proves them wrong. Gary used technology to create the opportunity for others to improve the future of America and, by extension, the rest of the world. And this multiplier effect of distributed disruptive technology can be hugely impactful and extremely efficient in addressing some of our present problems. Before I close, here's a little bit of information about Gary. He's a self-described aging geek, a CNN hero, lecturer and speaker, including a TEDx, Points of Light Tribute winner, Purpose Prize Fellow, Huffington Post Greatest Person of the Day, and 2011 Game Changer, winner of the Russell uh, Berry Foundation's Making a Difference Award, winner of the Glenwood 2011 Wave of the Future Award, winner of the 2012 uh, Effenworks in Harmony with Hope Award, Echoing Green Semifinalist, and someone I recently nominated for the World Food Prize. He now makes his home in the mountains of northern New Jersey after having lived on a boat on the Hudson River in Manhattan since 1978. He's also a master gardener, Rutgers environmental steward, former community garden director, a town environmental commissioner, I didn't even know they had such things, a small-scale farmer, a long-distance cyclist, and the founder and executive director of a nonprofit called AmpleHarvest.org. It's not often that a small tech-based charity gets the awards and accolades, including from the White House, and the recognition that they have. Google's technology, including AdWords, Map Engine, Alerts, Knowledge Graphs, Street View, YouTube, and more, are all a part of what makes AmpleHarvest.org work brilliantly. Google's been a proud partner in this effort, and I hope you, too, will find a way to help support AmpleHarvest.org's work. And I give you now Gary Oppenheimer. Thank you very much. Vint, thank you so much. I hope you're still seeing this, and I appreciate you and Carla taking the time, and especially, Vint, 
thank you for doing this on your birthday. This is Vince's birthday. <laughs> so. Hey, Gary, I'm 71. That means I'm in my prime. I think you will be in your prime for a very long time. <laughs> so, but thank you, thank you very, very much. Um, a lot of people come up here and they do Google Talks and they have written a book. They've done something that establishes credentials. I haven't had the time to write a book. I've been too busy doing the work I'm doing, but I figured I do need to establish my credentials for everybody here. That's my credential. I'm an aging geek, and in 1976, I soldered a computer together. It's older than anything you have out here in the lobby, and last week, just for the fun of it, I plugged it in. Good news was it didn't set the house on fire. Um, Interestingly, the hex display on there showed up with the number 50, although somebody said to me, that really is your mother saying so. Uh, but that's, that's my credentials. I wanted to um, show that to you so you can see what, this is a geek that's gone good. And I'm hoping that for those of you who choose to do any um, uh, tweeting about this talk, that you'll send this out to your network of um, the people that you communicate with. We're going to be talking about four different topics today. Food waste, as Vint had said. The, uh, the impact of food waste, the solution, and what's going on in, in the future. We're going to have this in a three-part today. We're going to be, I'm going to talk for about 15 minutes. Then Kim, and by the way, Kim, thank you very much for setting this up. I appreciate it. But Kim's going to, we're going to do a Q&A up here. And then for the, about half an hour, give or take, I'd like to open this up to questions from the audience, from all of you. So please think about things you want to ask about, questions, concerns, ideas. I really would like to hear them. Everything comes with a tipping point. This was one of my several tipping points. This was a photograph in the New York Times, 19, uh, 2008, by Bill Marsh. This represents the amount of food lost in America by a family of four in a month. About a pound a person a day. At that time, it was about 100 billion pounds a year. This is something that everybody owns, from the farmer to the uh, consumer. So this was what sort of caught my eye. More recently, on discussions about food waste, the USDA issued this report. This is only about a month old, actually. And their look-back report going back to 2010 is just plain frightening. In 2010, America lost $161 billion worth of food in one year. We talk about our budget, our, 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 the, how it affects the economy. Imagine if somebody had to write a check for $161 billion. We flushed that away in food waste. Uh, a third of our food didn't get consumed, and that's a significant chunk of what we could have been giving people across America as um, uh, the nutrition that they need. In 2012, the National Resource Defense Council issued this report. Now, although the report came uh, before the USDA report, it's actually using later data, so the two of them swap a little bit. Their computations were 40% of the food in this country is not consumed. 4% of the energy America produces got lost. 32% of the water we have wasn't, was wasted, because water is a huge part of our use of water for agriculture. And it represented about 20 pounds of person of food a month. So this is hurting everybody across the country. This is from that NRDC report. I'd like you to focus for a minute on the large uh, red and green pies on there. That's fruit and vegetables in billions of pounds. So we're looking at about 18 and a half billion pounds of, of fruit, about 25 billion pounds of vegetables that didn't get consumed. We all own this problem. As I said, it starts at the farm and it ends at the kitchen table. Everybody has a piece of this, um, of this problem. What was not in any of these reports, however, were the people like myself and maybe like you who are home and community gardeners. No one's ever really looked at that information in any detail about the food that we have and the food that we're not actually using. The National Gardening Association issued a report very recently, and we're now up to 42 million people in this country growing food in home and community gardens. That's about a, a little more than a third of all the households. It's a 17% in the past five years. And most interestingly, the average gardener harvests about 300 pounds of food a year. 
Now, it's not 300 pounds over the course of a year because we don't grow over the course of a year. That's compressed into your growing season. So you're waiting for maybe nine months, and then in three months, you're dealing with a staggering amount of food, which is typically more than you can use, preserve, or you can share with friends. This is not just in the suburbs. An increasing amount of people in urban settings are growing food. And even in the younger generation, millennials, it's a huge increase in the number of people who are growing food for themselves. The food waste on the grower side comes from enthusiasm, overplanting, not being able to share with friends. I've discovered personally there's only so many cucumbers you can give to friends and still have them call you a friend. Not choosing not to preserve and can, and just getting bored and overwhelmed. Come August and September, the tomatoes are still producing and you're fed up. The stuff is left to rot or goes into um, uh, the garbage. So what's the impact of this food waste? This is not a political map. Let me start with this. Those red states, these 23 states, if you add the combined population of the states, you're looking at the number of people in this country who are food insecure. Food insecurity, by the way, means either that you're hungry or you're at real risk of being hungry. So one out of every six Americans are considered food insecure. It's about 50 million people. One out of every four children in this country are growing up in a food insecure home, and in some populations, it's one out of every three children. These kids who don't eat well don't do well in school. Their parents who don't eat, do well don't do well in the workplace. So the country is hurting today's economy and tomorrow's economy by not nourishing the people that uh, need the food the most. The impact from the health perspective is staggering. People are arguing about the um, Affordable Health Care Act, Obamacare. Really, what's coming down the pike are staggering numbers on obesity, type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and other food-related illnesses. Things that we could prevent and actually fix are trending to the worst in part because of the food that's available to too many people. I had a brief chat with General Clark in October, retired. Three out of four young people who apply to the military service are rejected because they're not fit to serve. <clears throat> How does the food system work today? The food safety net, the food bank system. If you look at the chart, let me see if the pointer is working. It does. All right. The red dot in the middle is Feeding America. <clears throat> that is an organization that represents and, and sort of coordinates 203 food banks across America. Food banks being large warehouse type operations that collect and redistribute food. They connect to 33,500 food pantries, soup kitchens, and other similar food distribution agencies across the country. That system works very nicely for processed food. You want to have bread, corn flakes, things, works very, very nicely. One of the problems is, however, the distribution cycle. If you look at that red line on the bottom mark time, it can take days or weeks for food to move from that food bank to a food pantry. The result is that while processed can jars, boxes work fine, fresh food doesn't work, which is why when you go to a food drive, you're always told, jars, cans, boxes, no fresh food. The result is that 42 million people like myself who grow food in home gardens often end up just tossing it away if it's more than you can use. You either compost it or worse, it goes into the landfill and creates environmental problems. In March of 09, I had an idea. The idea was, what if we could enable these people who have too much food in their home gardens, myself included, by the way, to be able to donate food to the people in the community who most need it? This came out of a discussion I had in the community garden I was running. I said to these people, if you're going to have an ample harvest, the least we can do is give it away to people. That just rolled off my tongue. That was another tipping point, because I found out ampleharvest.org was an available domain, so I grabbed it. I had spent the $9 on that, and I couldn't let that go to waste, so I got, that brought me to here. Um, but the idea was to enable the food to be donated, and I had a f nobody had ever really done that before on a large scale. But the vision I had, the idea was, let's bypass the choke point, and let's get that food directly to the food pantries in the, in, in the communities. Because the food, you could live in northern Vermont and be a three-hour drive from the regional food bank, or you could go down the street or across town to, a, to the nearby food pantry. So that's how ampleharvest.org was actually born. The idea was to both be a in-the-cloud registry of food pantries across America, an opt-in registry, by the way. This is something where each pantry says, we want to be a part of this, and a search engine 
And by the way, Google was an inspiration from that perspective in my mind for how to build this. A search engine to actually find the food pantries in your neighborhood and then for you to actually take the food directly to the food pantry yourself. We're not involved, so we had zero logistics. The hope and the intent was to create a system whereby once you knew you could and should donate the food and we enabled it, you would do so for the rest of your gardening life. And on top of that, you would tell your friends who are complaining that they've grown too much food that they had the opportunity to, um, to donate the food. This is what ampleharvest.org looks like today. It's, if you, it looks very familiar for those of you familiar with Google Maps. It's basically a search engine. There's a database of pantries. You pick the pantry that you want. You find the pantry, and now you've got a direct connection with that food pantry. One of the pantries did something I hadn't expected. It was His Hands Food Cupboard. This particular pantry registered, and where they, I, they did something in their listing I hadn't expected. They talked back to the community and said, hey, we need stuff from you. It was the first time I saw that, and it dawned to me, my God, these pantries are talking back to the community. They're telling the community what they really need. That created a whole new market efficiency, and we're building the new ample harvest that you'll be learning about in a few minutes around the idea that not only can you donate food, but the, but the pantries can actually help guide you to what they most importantly need. So the innovations were all over the place. As it turned out, I built this, and then I looked back and said, my God, look at all these things that are in there. The food system gets improved. Behavior gets changed. The environment is impacted. And the impact on society as a whole has changed. But basically, it's a very empowering resource for anybody to be able to go and to say, I can be the game changer for my own community. For the first time, food pantries across America that almost never have fresh food suddenly have the opportunity to offer fresh food to the people in their own communities. This is in Bridgeport, Connecticut. It's an urban city. Somebody donated food that would have been thrown away to a food pantry. Just imagine what that, that type of change that happens, whether you're in Bridgeport or New York or any other city, or suburb or rural setting. It, it works all over. So ampleharvest.org, I had this idea in March of 2009. In, uh, it took me seven weeks from that idea date to get it built and to get it rolled out. And by the way, at the time it was done by three people, a woman uh, who donated her time and talent for the front end, the pretty part, what looks good, a gentleman who put together his time for building the database, and I did the content. So basically, if it's pretty, Maureen did it. If it's j data, Josh did it. And if you can read it, I did it. Once it was put together and we were at this point, the first pantry signed up. I started making heavy use of Google Alerts to start telling me about other pantries and other connections to start spreading the word. This was 100 pantries on June 20. Now, what's interesting is that I had gone to Google and said, do you guys have anything you can help us with? We've got this really cool idea. And uh, the answer was, yeah, Google has an AdWords grant program. We applied. We got fast-tracked through that system really fast. And whoever I owe thanks to, thank you. And so in the time between launch and this date, Ample Harvest Dollar was already up on, on AdWords. And I have to say, I knew nothing about AdWords myself. There was a quick learn I had to go through. And at this point, Ample Harvest Dollar was now a one-person operation, largely me. This is 500 pantries in August. We had 1,000 pantries on October 15, which just happened to be World Food Day. 2,000 pantries. And today, we're at nearly 7,000 food pantries, one out of every five in America. This means that people who live in these communities for the first time ever are able to donate food to a food pantry in their own community. Media coverage went off the roof. It was wonderful. Instead of food going into waste stream, people were donating food from home gardens. Small farmers were donating food, and it was getting into the pantry system. And by the way, just so everybody knows, the feedback from the pantries has been that when the fresh food shows up, it's the first thing the clients go for. I mean, there's been this idea that do people really want fresh food? They do, and it's the first thing they go for. So for the future. You're looking at the new ampleharvest.org. We're announcing it right here, right now. Ampleharvest.org as a website and as a system is being rebuilt. This is our new look. This is our new logo. So I hope you like it. This is what the new ampleharvest.org page is going to look like. It's built around Google technologies, a whole lot of which I don't know a lot about, but I've got an amazing tech team working on it with help from Google engineers, which they've been, just been wonderful. So this is what the new Google uh, Ample Harvest website is going to be looking like. It's going to be out in a month or so. 
The programs that we have in place for ampleharvest.org, it's going to be using time management, push technology, a whole bunch of new Google things. We're going to, in the future, be building gleaningharvest.org, which will be ampleharvest.org on steroids. It's going to be a resource that's not going to work with the home gardener, but with the even larger amount of food left behind on farms across America. Farmers harvest their stuff and a few things happen. One of which is the machinery leaves a lot in the ground. Another is the prices drop and the farmer says, I'm not even gonna bother harvesting it. There are many different things, carrots too long, too short, cosmetically not perfect. Gleaning organizations are gonna be getting a spotlight from gleaningharvest.org. We're gonna be building this whole thing on Google technology and for the first time, we'll be able to connect gleaning organizations to the farms, just like we now connect home, home gardeners to the pantries. And we'll go further into the ending this scourge, really, of, of, of wasted food in the country. And let me see if I can get this working, because this is something that was, um, well, this is the level of support the that we've gotten. The response to this initiative has been overwhelming. I mean, all kinds of faith communities have been stepping up. Muslim community leaders are hosting sports tournaments to encourage young people to get active. Uh, the Jewish Community Centers Association is working with JCCs around the country to grow gardens and to get fresh food in underserved areas. And they're creating early child wellness programs. Groups like the National Council of Churches have joined with an organization called Ample Harvest to help gardeners donate fresh produce to 4,700 of their local food pantries. This was a year or two, this is about two years ago, and the First Lady staff had contacted me and said, you may want to watch the speech. My wife didn't know why I was screaming. <laughs> but thanks to the White House, we've had wonderful support from the White House, both the President's office and the First Lady's office. As of last week, ampleharvest.org is now included in Feds Feed Families, which is the U.S. government's own food drive. Given the size of the U.S. government, the largest employer in America, this means that about one million home gardeners, if government employees represent the um, average American, will be learning about the opportunity that they can donate food. So this is a huge jump for reducing food waste and improving the nutrition in the country. Next month, ampleharvest.org is going to be included in the Google Economic Impact Report, which is a huge honor for us. And we're again going to be doing Skip the Flowers. And just when you are looking to do events where you're going to have flowers, whether it's a holiday table or an event, consider the idea of actually using arrangements of whole fruits and vegetables instead of flowers and just donate that food the next day to a food pantry. So what has made ampleharvest.org so special? It's, it, it's simple. It's a no-brainer. It's very efficient. We have no logistics. Everything is local in the community. It's universal. It works any, every place. And the resources you need are every place. And most important, it fixes some really critical problems in our country. There are some other really important things about what makes ampleharvest.org so, so good. One of the key things, I'm going to go into that more in a moment, is that it is so efficient from a cost perspective. It costs so little compared to any other program. So these have been our partners that uh, ampleharvest.org has, has, has benefited from. Google, of course, being an immense partner. We're now a, a Google, uh, the, the largest grant Google has in terms of AdWords, $40,000 a month, so thank you all. BV, uh, which is a wine company out west, has been our biggest supporter in terms of, uh, of income. They're really big on pushing and encouraging innovative ideas to deal with hunger. And as a matter of fact, when this is over, you're going to enjoy their, the fruits of their labor uh, in the back of the room. Um, so now we go to this other piece of this no good deed unpunished goes unpunished sort of idea and that is that I have discovered that in the nonprofit world great ideas don't receive quite the reception they receive in the for-profit world. So what we've discovered it's been interesting is that when a you have a new idea people look at it the old way. The typical food bank model is how many pounds of food how many meals did you serve? That really doesn't work here. And as a matter of fact, when you hear, this is the, the questions that we've realized become really important. And I did a thought experiment, by the way, that brought me to this, because I originally thought this was a hunger program. It was the obvious thing to me was we're feeding people. So I had this very quick thought experiment I want to do with all of you for a minute. Imagine every food pantry in America, all 33,500 are on ampleharvest.org. And imagine every grower in America, all 42 million knew about their opportunity, opportunity to donate food. And imagine 
if there was a drought or a blight and every garden in America died, nothing was harvested that year. Are we a success or are we, a, is ampleharvest.org a success or a failure? So show of hands, how many say ampleharvest.org is a success? All right, how many say failure? All right, well you had the same idea that I had. The fact that the food wasn't, couldn't be moved had nothing to do with us. We had set up the conduit for the food to move. And that's where I came to the realization that the heart of ampleharvest.org is not so much feeding people, but getting people fed. It's a supply side channel for the food bank system. Once I got to that realization, this has been part of this problem of being in the weeds and not being in the forest, I started to understand the really bigger impact of what this program is all about and the people who are working on it, what we all share. That red dot in that orange circle represents a single soup kitchen in Washington, D.C., nine mile radius circle around it, 250 square miles, and the question is how many growers live in 250 square miles? Depends on where you are, but you know it's not zero. We've created the opportunity for those growers to donate food to that pantry. And then look how many dots are on the map right now. That's the amount of opportunity that ampleharvest.org has now represents and growing to change the future of the country. The other problem was a more interesting one from the support perspective in terms of getting funding from foundations. Your typical uh, food funding organization working with a food organization works like this. They ask for $100,000. 10,000 goes to operations, $90,000 goes to food. You feed the families, you run out of food, you come back again, you ask for more money. That loop goes on and on and on and on. And your bean counters look at it and they say, well, only 10% overhead, that's really kind of cool. Go with it. Then a scrappy young nonprofit comes along and says, well, we don't need the $90,000 for, for the food. The food's already in the community. We do need money for staff and technology, so 10,000 please. You look at it first, you say $10,000 to permanently fix a system that doesn't need to be refunded over and over and over and over and over again, and you say, really cool. And then your bean counter comes along and says, wait a minute, it's 100% overhead. And suddenly, the bean counter says, we can't help you out because you're all overhead. Innovative ideas I've discovered in the charity world with innovative models often struggle up against the idea that the, with innovation comes a roadblock from the old ways of doing things. This is exactly the type of PowerPoint slide you're not supposed to do. So I did it. Scan on the left hand side and you're just going to pick out one or two of them. These are emails that we've received from people who say I need help. On the right hand side, those are emails from people who say how can I help? This is America side by side, 50 people needing help, 42 million people saying they can help. And all that's been separating them has been the lack of awareness that they already could be helping each other, which is what ampleharvest.org has fixed and continues to fix. Google has been an amazing partner for ampleharvest.org. We're blessed and, and, and honored and we wanna let you know how Googlers, how people here and people watching can also help. One of the things is ampleharvest.org slash local, which is a pr something open to anybody and everybody across the country. The idea that there are things you can do in your own community to cement the ampleharvest.org model in your community. It takes a few hours of work, and it's a step-by-step -step type of process. The second thing is things specific to Google, including, including on that Google page, the fact that Google now matches all donations to ampleharvest.org up to $6,000. Uh, I do speakers and also we're looking for more engagement from people, so people who want to help out, have ideas, suggestions, whatever. I hope that um, it's a type of thing that will move and inspire people. The heart behind ampleharvest.org is the fact that people are able to do things they thought they couldn't do. Everybody wants to be somebody special. I, um, uh, as a kid, I wanted to be Superman. I used to fly into my parents' bed. Um, we grew up eventually thinking that that's just not the way it is. We have the real lives. The reality is that ampleharvest.org's model is enabling anybody to be the game changer in their own community. I was actually, CNN had asked me at one point, what's it feel like to be a hero? And I said, it's really not about me. This is about 42 million people being the hero in their own community. When I was a kid, my mother loved Leonard Bernstein, the, the, the uh, conductor, and I never got it. I saw a guy with his back to the audience waving a stick. And I said to her, the musicians are making all the music. This guy's waving a stick. 
Ampleharvest.org is waving the stick, but it's 42 million people across the country who can make the f difference in the ch future of the country, the health of the children, the economy, and the welfare of the nation. So I want to thank you all very, very much, and I think Kim and I are going to have a brief question and answer, and then open it up to questions from all of you. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. That was very inspiring. Thank you. So I'm, now I'm going to ask you some intensely personal questions. Okay. No, not really. So you are a techie, a gardener, an environmentalist, and then you created a hunger food waste program. How did that happen? I hate waste, seriously. I grew up with finished words on your plate, kids are starving in Europe. And um, I saw the waste, and I like solving problems. I mean, Vint had talked about the fact that I, I, when I was a part of MCI, I saw a company that was, had produced MCI Mail, a really wonderful email service, but they weren't communicating with their own customers. And I said, let me send them out a newsletter. So I created the um, newsletter, which maybe means I may have been one of the first creators of spam, so my apologies. But um, the point was, I see disconnects, and this was a clear disconnect, and it was an easy one to fix, too, because nothing new had to be built. It was just connecting the dots, and that's what got me to here. Cool. So since you've uh, created Ample Harvest, what's been the most surprising thing that you've learned? Uh, what I was just talking about, the difficulty innovative charities have in getting support. There, I've seen lots of other charities out there with really great ideas in all sorts of realms struggle up against the fact that they're doing new things and the old way is uh, what's more accepted. I, imagine for a minute go, if you built a better mousetrap and you came to a for-profit company and they threw money at you to, pro, uh, to, to market it, and in the not-for-profit world, the better mousetrap, they say, that's nice, but we fund cats. Um, this has been the problem, and I think it holds back the uh, improvement of our society because people who have really good ideas get stymied by the fact that they can't be as impactful as they could be just for lack of the, the old system not catching up with them. There's a funding curve that lags behind the, the um, innovation curve. That's been very frustrating. Ah, well, maybe you answered my next question, Sorry. which was, what's your biggest disappointment? In that vein, the biggest disappointment is we couldn't have done more than we've done so far. Um, I, I'm, this model, and others like it, by the way, this model is a no-brainer for the country. And uh, if, I, if we had the staff and the resources we needed, we could have, as impactful as we've been, we could have been much more impactful many times over. I was actually approached at a conference uh, that I was at, and we were in the room with the big boys, you know, Oxfam and Red Cross, and somebody said, how much money do you need? And I said, 500. And the guy said, million? I said, no, 1,000. And he just gave me a blank stare. It was sort of like, how can you do something? This is, that's been the frustrating thing. Um, it's, we're, we're gonna deal with it. We're gonna, we're, uh, we're, how, how do you think that changes? How do you make that change? I mean, change those minds to get out of that old system. Oh gosh, uh, you keep banging away at it. You keep working at it. You don't give up. You uh, keep proving that it works. You don't lose heart. And um, uh, you take solace in the fact that you are doing good and you're making the world better. You're leaving the place better than you found it, which I think is the heart of what anybody should be doing if they want to get into doing good. What, uh, you touched on it a bit in your talk, but what are your long-term hopes for Ample Harvest? I'd like to put us out of business. <laughs> I, I, it's, it sounds glib to say, because you'd never hear many other organizations say that, but if you think about it for a moment, when I was growing up, and I'm, I'll be 62 in, in November, when I was growing up, people were looking for money for polio and smallpox. Anybody here get a solicitation for either of those lately? No. Nah. They solved the problem and they went home. And I think a good charity should find a problem, solve it, and go home. Because there's lots of other places where money and support is needed. And uh, find the problem, be able to fix it, or at least severely diminish the problem, and be done with it. I think we can get to a point in America where everybody looks at, at excess food the same way we all look at, for example, old coats. You get an old coat, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? The Goodwill bin or something else down, down the road. You drop it off hoping that somebody else is going to be able to use the coat that you don't want anymore. We should be doing that with all of our food. If we have more food, and it's not just gardeners, by the way, but if we have more food that we can, than we can use, we should be finding ways either not to have purchased and prepared that much in the first place, or if we have, especially fresh food, get it to people who really, really need it. It is a, um, 
it's forgive the pun, it's the low-hanging fruit in solving so many of our problems in our country. It really is. You get kids eating fresh food instead of processed food. You get them eating potatoes instead of potato chips. You get them to learn that apples don't come pre-sliced in cellophane. You start to change the future of how these kids grow up and um, the diabetes and obesity problems that is going to really hurt this country gets thwarted. It's, it's not hard to do, and it's not expensive at all. So you are touching the world of food, waste, and hunger all the time. What's the most difficult story that you've come across? Yeah. Um, I, um, you saw that list of emails I put up. That was a small sample. We get emails from people all the time saying, I'm hungry, I need help. Um, can you help us? And we can't actually. That's not our role. Remember, we're fixing this pipeline from, the, from growers to food pantries. We don't feed people. We're partnered with both whyhunger.org and the United Way. Whyhunger.org particularly is an amazing organization. And their job is to f connect a hungry family to a food resource in their own community. Um, so we send them off that way. But by the way, every, each person who does send one of those emails gets a reply from myself or somebody else saying, we're really sorry. Here's where um, you can go. One woman wrote to me, one of those letters, I'm having a difficult time, um, the, I can't feed my family, my husband's ill, and I don't remember the de details of it, but what blew me off was when I saw the bottom, she was active due to U.S. Navy. That hurt. That shouldn't be. Sorry, I get choked up about that still. That was tough. Um, that was the toughest, probably. But that's what's going on in the country. Can you tell us a, one of the best stories? Yeah, um, I actually have it on my t thing. I want to read it because it's, th it's that good a story. Uh, this was an email that I had gotten, and um, I, was, I, hope to, I hope it's still here. A woman who was raising a bunch of kids, and she had, um, uh, let's see, here we go. I'm going to just read this so you can see what this was. This is just a wonderful, wonderful short story. I'm the mother of seven, 15 grandchildren and others that I'm mom to. We have a garden that we plan for us, but it's not enough. If um, She got the kids planting food. She got the kids involved in, in the gardening. And um, the kids got really, really excited about seeing the food growing. Uh, if you could see the garden, the face of the babies when they, and, which she quote unquote babies, when they go out and get the food and the veggies for supper, it was so wonderful for them to get fresh veggies. That was good for them. One of my babies last year ate every tomato on one plant. These were his tomatoes. The mom said he hated them, but sure was changed her mind when he was eating them here. We have lemon trees, pineapple trees, et cetera, et cetera. Kids react to the fact when, you, when they can taste what a real piece of produce tastes like, it changes them. And this kid, whoever this kid is, is changed for life. And this happens to millions of kids across the country. That's great. I mean, that offsets the, the, the Navy lady story many times over. It's, it's really nice. That's a great story. That's a good one. So what would you be doing if you weren't doing ample harvest? The glib answer is I'd be biking. I'm a long distance biker I'm flying across the country, I really. Um, I have other ideas for things I'd like to do. Um, I've had one dream I figured out. I didn't even figure it out. I was taught in first grade how to end gridlock in Washington. It's a stupid, simple idea. I'd love to find a way to incorporate. You stop sit, having these people sit here and that people sit here. Make Congress sit in alphabetical order. And I bet your problems start to dissolve because people talk to each other. Things like that. These are not complex problems to solve. They're easy to do. And I'd put my energies into that, but I'd still get the cross-country bike ride in. Okay. <laughs> now, you've said that Google has been an immense part of Ample Harvest nationwide success. Yeah, what, big time. What can individual Googlers do to help move Ample Harvest to the next level? And, and maybe not just Googlers, but anybody. Um... We love ideas, we love energy, we love people getting involved, we, and, and funding. I mean, one of the nice things I said earlier was that Google actually matches donations. But this is something, this is a viral campaign, a viral program, frankly. I mean, once you know how to fix the problem in your own community, you can spread it across your own community without having any involvement from us. So what, whether you're a Googler or whether you're anybody else in the country, spreading the word, Taking the effort yourself not to waste food, by the way, and there are many great, uh, Jonathan Bloom, by the way, who's part of our organization, has an amazing book called uh, American Wasteland. His, his blog is wastedfood.com. 
take a look at it or take a look at, at, at um, Tristan Stewart's TED Talk on food waste. Both of these are really good places to look to see what are we doing and what can we be doing better. So um, looking at how you're doing, what you can do about food waste, but uh, we've had people within Google who've stepped up and said, I'm an engineer, I do this, and I want to help. Vince Cerf, Carl Lefevre, who works with him, these are amazing people who've stepped up and said, we want to be a part of this and we want to help. The help, this is a small organization, just so you know, at this point, we're three and a half people. I mean, think about the national impact for three and a half people. We're supposed to be seven people. That's where a half million dollar budget actually ultimately goes to with all the technology and everything. It's never going to be a big organization. That means that people coming in and helping out can be immensely helpful. You're, the, the, the opportunity to be a part of the change, to make the change, to influence the change is immense. And um, I can't think of a better talent of pool than people like, uh, like, like, like Google has. I mean, people coming in with ideas, not afraid of uh, innovation, not afraid to experiment and risk succeeding, I think is an amazing thing for Google and for ampleharvest.org. Um, and of course, I'll be honestly, funding support, any place people can find ways to help support us financially will help us get past the point of asking for money and doing more with the money is, is immensely helpful to the future health and wealth, as Vint put it, of America. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. I think it's time to turn it over to you guys. So if anyone has a question, I can pass the mic. Or I think that's that's working over there, too, if you want. I'll go on this side. I'm just okay. going to walk back and forth. Hello. Hi. Uh, to ask a bean countery question, do you have an estimate of the dollar value of the goods that you've facilitated moving from growers to the food banks? No. Uh, that's a really good question, and I appreciate you you're, you're leading in with the bean counter type of thing. But it's it's an it's honestly the dollar value is not as important as the nutritional value, because the nutritional value represents a multiplier effect. If I if I'm making up a number, if I donate hundred dollars of tomatoes, I've benefited the community by hundred dollars, frankly. But if I donate hundred dollars worth of health, the long term impact of that in terms of the reduction of future health issues, many times magnifies that, that over. Um, from a metrics perspective, I should say that the discussion that's always been with food has been how many pounds, how many meals, I touched on that. Um, in the fresh food realm, poundage doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. I mean, how you can compare donations of watermelon and spinach? The same weight of the two, spinach is immensely more help beneficial to the community in the country than watermelon is. Um, one of the projects we have lined up, and the Clinton people would like to see us do it, is the Community Nutritional Index. The, uh, this is a model that I have in my mind that takes what I used to see in PC Magazine in my geeky days, which how you sort, sort of measured out the relative value of this brand of computer versus that brand of computer, and apply it to fresh food, which would then start to get us closer to the financial question you're asking, because under that scenario, we can then realize that a pound of watermelon is equal to this much of this, and look at the individual macro and micronutrients. That can then get translated to a dollar value. One of the informal advisors for ampleharvest.org is Rear Admiral Dr. Susan Blumenthal, who's the former Assistant Surgeon General of the United States. So we have access to a wealth of um, medical input and, and, and health ideas along those lines. Um, we've documented informally many, many tens of millions of dollars of, uh, uh, tens of millions of pounds, I'm sorry, of food having come in. Why can't we give you an exact number? If you remember that big green line that came from the gardener to the pantry, the food doesn't pass through us. We don't touch the food, there's no logistics. We ask people to tell us what you've donated, but the other sides of the food pantries are really lousy at metrics. They don't have scales. We ask them how much food, we get bags, uh, uh, we get boxes, we get bushels, we get one food pantry. We did an early survey and we said, how many pounds of food did you get? Did, we, did you possibly get? This was probably in 2010, we were less than a year old. They said nine million pounds. You know, we were seeing numbers like none, 500 pounds, 25 pounds, nine million. I called this person up, I said, is this a typo? And they said, no, no, a farmer heard about us through ampleharvest.org and started bringing truckloads of food. How do you measure that? Other than it's just, the, the, I was stunned, I was thrilled. The, the, one other question about the success of ampleharvest.org I have to point out, uh, because I was asked early on, how do you know when you're successful? And I said, this is my true feeling, I'm, we're successful when the first gardener donates the first delivery of food. 
Everything else after that's just building on the success, but the success was the first time food was donated. I hope someday we can give you a dollar number, uh, but I'd much rather actually say this many more people don't have colorectal cancer or this many more people don't have type 2 diabetes. I'll let somebody else figure out what that's worth to the country. I'd like to simply say we've saved this many lives or we've prolonged this many lives or we've reduced this amount of illness in the country. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Hey, thank you, first of all, Gary, for sharing that story with us. Thank you. Um, really cool just to hear your vision. Um, I was really curious to understand, can you talk to us a little bit more about some of the, the big problems and challenges that you faced? Obviously, um, raising money and the old model for thinking about success is something that you, you've told us about. But what are some of the other challenges that you face? And then maybe as a kind of follow-up, talk a little bit more about what um, an incremental or $500,000 more can do for you. Obviously, hiring more people, what would those people, maybe like what would those people do? You know, why, what, why is that, why that number? But let's start with the first one, which okay. is the, the, challenges, cha the challenges that you guys face outside of, outside of fundraising. Okay, the challenge, well, in effect, and I alluded to this, I think, is that we spend enough time worrying about and chasing money that we're not doing all the good we can and should be doing. In my dream scenario, to be honest, and I've said this, the guy who asked me the question about that 500 uh, when I was at the conference, I followed up with, if we got $2 million and you came back in four years, we'd be able to tell you the, this, the magnitude of impact on America because it's that cheap to be that big as an influence. Understanding something, what ampleharvest.org is doing and what other small charities like ampleharvest.org uh, is doing, it, we're not moving mountains. And we don't have to move a mountain. We put a pebble in somebody's shoe. A pebble in, in, in the shoe stops an army that a mountain couldn't stop. So it doesn't take a lot to redirect the way things are going to make, to make things actually happen. What we would be doing with that is we, the other programs that we want to build, gleaningharvest.org, Producepedia, and the nutritional, <coughs> nutritional Index would have been built by now. Producepedia is really very important. Um, I, this sort of came on my radar when a teacher wrote to me. We were probably about a year old. She said she brought an apple, a cucumber, and a, I think it was a pear or something, into her classroom. And most of the kids had no idea what a cucumber was. And I suspect they knew what the apple was because they probably had iPhones. But really, people are disconnected from the food. And so the idea behind Produspedia, what we want to build is something <coughs> whereby um, we will have a database of all the foods people grow, and I'm not just saying apples and carrots and oranges, I'm talking about very, very, very granularly. I grow tomatoes. Now, we, we all have tomatoes. You have the red tomatoes and the yellow tomatoes and the cherry tomatoes. And there are, anybody seen an Icelandic tomato? No, they're white, crim tomatoes, black. So if I were to bring Icelandic tomatoes into a food pantry, some, or crim one, which is black, people would say, it's, I don't know. The idea behind Produspedia is to create a printout a simple printout that not only says what the food is with a picture inside outside, but some basic information about it so that the, the pantry and the people, they would know what they're getting and, and what to do with it. Do you eat it raw? Do you cook it or, um, or whatever? So the food wouldn't go to waste. I grew purple carrots one year. My wife didn't know what to do with the stuff. Um, so you can imagine what it's like on, on a larger scale. The programs are lined up that I want to build. The staffing is what's needed to actually expand ampleharvest.org to its full potential impact. The, just to give you an idea, what this, we, the staff consists of one person whose full-time work is to work with the pantries, and every pantry that signs up, all 7,000, have been vetted by this person or by somebody in, in her position. We want to make sure when a pantry signs up that it's really a pantry and it fits our criteria of giving food away for free and being a nonprofit, that it's not something it shouldn't really be, so we're verifying each one. The other one, she's involved in reaching out to the gardeners across America saying the solution to hunger is in your backyard. I'm there sort of running the whole thing and trying to push the message out and we have a part-time admin. We need a few more people to do the, the stuff, the technology and all the other pieces that are, are in there. But Produspedia would be the final step in making sure the people at the pantry make the best use of the food. The uh, gleaningharvest.org, as I said, will, will dwarf ampleharvest.org in terms of the amount of food um, coming into the system. The, if you look at the NRDC reports, and if, by the way, for anybody who wants to see the presentation, if you go to ampleharvest.org slash Google Tech Talk, it'll be a PDF you can freely download. It's available right now. Um, the the gleaningharvest.org is going to connect 
people to organizations they never knew existed. I go into places all the time full of foodies. I say, do you know gleaners are gleaning organizations? Many people don't. It's in the Old Testament, Book of Ruth, uh, Deuteronomy, you know, leave the food in the corners, in the edges of your fields, don't pick up what you dropped. It's for the poor, the widow, and the traveler. We have organizations in this country that have volunteers, people, and most important, insurance, who will come to your farm or your community garden, harvest the food, and get it to the people who really need it. Except nobody knows they exist. We want to build a bridge built around Google Maps that's going to connect the people with these organizations, bring them together, and again, once that connection's made, it's permanent. And then after the farmer harvests the fields and X percent of the celery, of the potatoes are left, or the apple orchard, and a whole lot of apples are left down, volunteers can come in and that food gets into the system. I went to visit a food bank in Israel. The system's called Leket Israel, and I was, they have magnificent cleaning operations. It's, a, it's the gold standard for the world. And I was stunned. Um, nothing in that food bank was uh, uh, processed food with one exception. Israelis have this thing about this thick chocolate spread. But everything else was fresh produce that had been gleaned from farms across the country. And that's getting into a system. And we can and should be doing it here. And gleaning harvest is exactly the way I want to get that particular thing done. Did I answer your question? I want to make sure. OK. Is there another question? Yes. Oh, it's tall. Hi. Hi. Thanks for coming today. This is really interesting to learn. My pleasure. Thank you. Um, you've clearly done a great job of getting a lot of national attention to your organization. And as someone who works with nonprofits outside of work, I was wondering, what's your advice for to do that? And did, it, did any of it, was it impacted by the First Lady's agenda? Do you think that helped? That's a great question. I will tell you in all honesty, one of the big things was, believe it or not, Google Alerts. Um, I would have a flood of those coming in, and I had pre-scanned emails ready to go back out to reporters, um, news stations, whatever, saying, great story on food pantries, great story on hunger, great story on this. Here's a site for a follow-up for another story. We have a really good online press kit. The funny thing about the First Lady's office is that she rolled out Let's Move in, I think, early 2010. And I wrote a letter to the White House saying, I got this great new program. We'd love to partner with you. And somebody wrote back and said, thanks, but no thanks. Fine. No problem. Um, Christmas time, 2011, my wife and I had the privilege of being invited to the White House to meet the President and First Lady. So it was a thing of keep at it, keep working at it. It was actually connections ultimately through the USD that got us into the um, uh, White House. We'd been going after the Clinton, uh, Clinton Foundation and we were getting pushed back, pushed back, pushed back this past January. I was with President Clinton. Ampleharvest.org is a strategic partner of the Clinton Foundation, the Clinton Foundation's Health Matter Initiative. You keep at it, and honestly, if you're not succeeding here, just go another way. The heart of Ampleharvest.org actually is when you hit a roadblock, take a different path, which is strangely enough the underpinnings of the internet. I mean, when you're sending information, if this node is down, route it around that node. It's not really any different. The other thing is, and this is something that the man that Vint and I both, I guess, worked under at MCI, his saying, which I've adopted, is to do the impossible, you must first believe it isn't. His name was Bob Hartchark. I have an ashtray with that on there. I've tre I treasure it. It's really, really important that if you believe in something, whether it's in the not-for-profit or the for-profit world, stick to it, be true to it. If it's the right thing, um, it'll happen. It may not happen as big or as gloriously as you wanted. In my case, this happened far bigger and more gloriously than I ever expected. I mean, I'm an aging geek. I have no background in the nonprofit world. And I'm at a point now where, um, where I'm talking to you. I've met two presidents. I go around the country giving speeches. There's been a long litany of things that six years ago I would have never expected. The thing to do is also to... Um, Find people who believe the same thing you do. In invite them. Partner like crazy, by the way. Find, stick to your mission. That's super critical. There's something called mission creep. Never go down that path. If, you believe, if your mission is to do this, stick to it and find partners to do nearby things, but don't drift into their stuff. Uh, we've done that. We don't help people get food. We go to Why Hunger or National Hunger Hotline or, or United Way. That's their job. We don't tell people how to grow. National Gardening Association does a great job, as do others. We are that connector between the food in the community and the need in the community. And we're educating, encouraging, and enabling 
millions of growers to donate. And by the result of doing that, we, I hate the expression, but we own the space that we're in. Uh, people are using us as a resource to do their different things, which is great. There's a new student group in Florida that's doing a food recovery thing, and they're using ampleharvest.org's resources to help them do their stuff. And our model is now with our assistance being replicated around the world. I've met with people in, uh, well, I shouldn't say in, I've been to Greece and Israel, but others have either emailed, Skype, or, or whatever. England, Poland, uh, the UK, South Africa, Japan, New Zealand, Australia, I'm missing a few. And we're making this information freely available. This is how it works in America. Make it work in your system, in your language, your culture, whatever, in your country. The food waste issue is not an American problem, by the way. Tristan Stewart brilliantly shows it is a global problem. But it's also a global opportunity. We've got a model that, we fit, that was perfectly fit for the American Food Distribution Network. It was built for that. Um, and also, by the way, one other thing, and I wish I'd, I should have said this earlier, so I'm going to say it now. Um, think about other areas where you can influence things in the work you're doing that you wouldn't have thought about. I built ampleharvest.org with something called just-in-time inventory. And if in manufacturing, just-in-time inventory is something, having pieces arrive just when you need. When Boeing's making an airplane, they have the wings arrive just when it's ready to be attached to the fuselage. It's not sitting on the side. So it, things come just in time. Ampleharvest.org was built in a way in which we tell the pantries to tell the growers when to come. And th by the way, this one little speck changes a whole bunch of things. We told the pantries, tell the growers to come an hour or two before the clients come to pick up the food. Now, what happens as a result of that? Well, number one is the food comes in, stays a few hours, and goes out. We've eliminated the need for refrigeration and storage. It was a huge impediment for pantries nationwide to take fresh food. We have no place to store it. We have no place to refrigerate it. In, out, same-day basis, no refrigeration. But there's an ethical component to it, too. In our society, it's entirely likely that I'm growing more food than I can use, and you're my next-door neighbor who's fallen on hard times, and you're going to a pan food pantry. You're kind of humiliated as it is. You, know, you wish you could take care of your own family better. You didn't need to use a pantry. You shouldn't feel that way, but you do. The worst thing is for me to be showing up with my basket of food, you showing up to pick up your thing, and I'm embarrassed, and you're humiliated. By separating by time, I'm coming in a few hours before you. I know it's going to my community, but I don't know who. You know it came from your community, but you don't know who. The ethics in that's really, really important. The food moves, there's no refrigeration storage, and your, our relationship has nothing to do with this whole thing. You can find other ways to make, and that, those things alone excite other people. That gets people in five, wow, I can do these things too. And the last thing I would say is share your knowledge. I love talking at universities. Not because I like to talk, although I do. It's because I like to listen. And the students come back to me with some really great ideas and really, really great questions. And some of them have jazzed up things. And we've added things on Ample Harvest Order because somebody came to us with an idea that we never thought about. And it fits, and we do it. So share the knowledge, share the information, share your successes, share your failures. And, um, and I'm happy to talk to you further about it uh, if you want, whatever your endeavor is. Thanks. Thank you. So I think, unfortunately, we are out of time for the formal presentation, but we do have some beverages. We have a lot. We have a lot of beverages, so feel free to stay for beverages and more chatting. Thank you thank for you coming, and thank much. you, thank Gary. You.